Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to Saluda Baptist Church. Uh Uh-oh, I don't think I have my mic on. There we go. Now it's on. Can y'all hear me? Kind of? I can't hear myself. Maybe I got too much sand in my ear or something. I don't know. Anyway, it's good to be back. Welcome to Saluda Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Jeff. So good to see everyone here this morning. Pastor Brandon, you have some announcements for children and youth. I I do. uh, the, The only announcements that I have are just about our youth and our children's advisory committee meetings. Um, today at 5, we're going to have our Children's Advisory Committee meeting. Um, so if you are a part of that committee, if you're part of the Children's Committee, or you would like to be, or you're going to be, um, I really encourage you to try to be here. Uh, we're just going to dis- discuss some things that are coming up uh, with the Children's Ministry. And then the Youth Advisory Committee meeting will be next Sunday at 5. Um, so please mark those on your calendar. Wonderful. I've got two or three announcements. Most of these are in your bulletin. Number one, we, I want to remind everybody that we have our deacon election uh, beginning next week. Uh, there was a ballot, a sample ballot that was left over by the front, or the deacons have those. If you did not get one, please get one this morning before you leave so you can take a look at those. I would like to remind everybody uh, that vote will be next Sunday. The first round, second round will be the week after that. If you're not going to be here in person, we do have the ability to do an absentee vote uh, on, for a candidate that you would like. You just need to come by the church office. The church office, for those that don't know, uh, Monday through Thursday, 9, uh, I'm going to call it 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock. There's always somebody here, uh, and you can cast that vote absentee if you'd like to. I also would like to remind folks of our men's uh, river float trip. That's coming up uh, in about two weeks, I guess it is, on August 5th. We still have a couple spots open for that. Um, And also, uh, this is not really a church announcement, but one for the community. I know everybody's aware of uh, the success our softball and baseball teams have been having. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody that there is a fundraiser tonight for the Saluda teams, and I think this fundraiser goes to all the teams, but that's going to be over at St. Paul at 6 o'clock, a hamburger, uh, I was going to say cook-off, hamburger dinner, $10 $10 a plate. Please go and support these young people as they're preparing to go to the World Series. Would like to remind you there's a tear-out section in your bulletin. Uh, if you're visiting with us for the first time, we'd love to have a record of your attendance. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we'd ask you to put that, on, put that prayer request on that uh, piece of paper. Drop it in the offering plate. That comes directly to me. Now, if you're able, I would ask you to please stand and let's greet one another and the choir will call you back.
kind and gracious Heavenly Father. It's so, so good to be in your house this morning. Father, we just thank you for this privilege uh, to be here, to praise you this morning, to come and worship you this morning. And Father, I just pray that your spirit would move in a mighty, mighty way in and about each and every person. And those with us online, dear Lord, just be real with us this morning. Allow us to have an intimate moment with you this morning, worship you and praising you in all that we are. Father, we just pray that you'd be with us as we sing to you, that our songs would be sweet to your ear. Father, we pray that you'd be with us during our time of study, that we would uh, hear your words specifically spoken to our hearts. And Father, we just pray this morning that we become changed people because of what you will do in and through us. Father, we love you and we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and Still we are the voice in the desert Crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord Behold he comes Riding on the clouds Shining like the sun At the trumpet call So lift your voice It's the year of Jubilee And out of Zion Salvation comes. These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming a flesh. And these are the days of your servant David rebuilding the temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are as white in the world, and we are your laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, so lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion till salvation comes. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, so lift your voice. Year of Jubilee, and out of Zion till salvation comes. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, so lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion till salvation comes. good. Can you wait to see him? It's going to be a great thing when he comes. Mr. Bill says, keep your eyes peeled on the east.
figured it out. That's right. Good morning. <clears throat> the verse this morning comes out of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day and just thank you for uh, everyone that is here today. And Lord, we just ask that you will open all our hearts and, and uh, to hear what the pastor has to say and hear what you have to say, Lord. Lord, I just ask that you will pray over this community, pray over this church, pray over this country. And just, Lord, I just ask that we will earnestly seek you, just like this verse says. And this time, Lord, I just ask that you will uh, bless these tithes and offerings to the further of your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
So now I want to invite any children that would like to come forward for our children's corner to please come forward now. And just a reminder to all our parents that uh, immediately after our children's corner, we will leave to go back for children's church. <laughs> Y'all can sit over here. <laughs> I was just moving stuff so you had a room. <laughs> all right. So, I have a picture I want to show you guys. So, what is this picture of? A heart. A heart. Good job. So, how many of you guys have a heart? Everybody has a heart, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. we all have a heart. Now, is, is your heart important? Your heart's very important. If you don't have your heart, you wouldn't be able to be alive. So, what are some things that we can do to take care of our heart? Does anybody know, what are some things that you can do to make your heart healthy and your heart feel good? You don't know? Ford, do you know something? What's something you can do to make your your heart feel good? So one thing, do you think eating, like, ice cream every day and candy every day would be good for your heart? Or, like, greasy food every day, do you think that's good for your heart? Or, or drinking like nothing but soda and all that. You think that's good for your heart? No. So we can eat good, healthy food. That's good for our hearts. That makes our hearts healthy. You know something else that we can do to make our hearts healthy? We can exercise. Or we can go outside and play and run and jump and do all those things. Play sports. Yeah, shoot basketball. All those things are called exercise. And they make our hearts healthy. But you know, there's also something else that is a problem for our hearts And that's called sin. See, sin is anything that we think or say or do that goes against God's word. And that makes our hearts dark. That makes our hearts full of sin. And our hearts have a problem. But you know the only solution to this problem? It's not running or eating right or drinking a lot of water, but it's Jesus. And the Bible says in... Well, my Bible got flipped to... (laughs) Philippians, that's okay. In Ephesians chapter 6, let me get there. Verse 14, it says, And on your chest wear the breastplate of righteousness. See, God is giving us the righteousness of Jesus to protect our hearts. And if we believe in Jesus, our hearts are freed of sin, and God makes them new. And so that's what we're going to talk about in Children's Church is this breastplate of righteousness and how that can protect our hearts, just like exercise and eating right. All right, so let's pray, and then we'll go to Children's Church. Dear God, I thank you for this day. And God, I just pray that you'll help us learn more about how you want us to guard and protect our hearts through Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm kind of trying to figure out who told Pastor Brandon that I had ice cream every day last week. <laughs> you see, the way I was brought up, ice cream is milk, which is dairy, which... Amen. 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 See, I got a good amen to start off with. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there before I get in trouble. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just thank you. Lord, I thank you so much for this privilege. To, to, to be able to stand here this morning and proclaim your word. And Father, I just pray this morning that uh, your spirit would move in each and every person that's here, and those with us online. Father, I pray that you'd be with me this morning. And Father, just hide me behind the, behind the cross. Father, allow your words to be spoken, your words to be heard by each and every person here. And Father, as we've prayed already, that we would be changed people because of your precious word. Father, be with us now. Guide us and direct us and lead us in this time of study. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd I'd like to open up by expressing a heartfelt gratitude uh, to the church for allowing Kelly and I to to go on vacation last week. We really had a lot of good downtime. We went down to Florida, spent time with the family while we were there, and just were able to relax and decompress, and I would say even rejuvenate uh, ourselves as we were there, but it's always good to be back. I had kind of this 
feeling of excitement this morning as I was getting up and getting ready. I actually got up a little bit earlier than normal today because I was ready to come and worship at my church home my, with my family. Uh, you know, there's something about, we watched Saluda Baptist Church last week online, but there's something about being here. I love to be here. I love to see the smiles and, and get the hugs and and uh, we just enjoy being here. So it's so good to be back. And, and I got to tell you, sometimes I, 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 I've been gone a week. Uh, and I think I was telling Miss Marsu this, somebody this morning. Uh, been gone a week, but it feels like I've been gone for a month. I don't know how folks can miss a couple, three weeks without, you know, just feeling like you're missing something. But it, it's good to be back home. Uh, but I would tell you this morning, the Lord has placed something on my heart. Uh, I'm very passionate about this passage that we're going to be studying this morning, if you have your Bibles, and I pray that you do, that you would turn to the book of Acts. That's where we're going to be, Acts chapter 1. Um, because everybody was on vacation, we didn't get it in the bulletin uh, for this week. But Acts chapter 1 is where we're going to study. Uh, there's no doubt that the Lord has placed it on my heart. There's no doubt in my mind that he has placed it there for us to hear and for us to study as a church family, for us to understand uh, the, the scriptures today. Uh, you know, a couple weeks ago when I preached, when I last preached, we were also in the book of Acts. We were in chapter 2 um, uh, where we saw the words or some of the words from what we would call the first Christian sermon that was ever preached. It was on the day of Pentecost back many, many, many years ago. Uh, and, and we studied those words and uh, uh, I believe we, we, are, we have grown because of that. But uh, that was in chapter 2. And that's really what we call the start of the church age, uh, if you will. But today we're going to be in chapter 1, uh, and this is just a few moments, if you will. It feels like a few moments prior to that time that we preached on a couple weeks ago. But as we did then, as, and as I try to always do, I like to start with context. I like to start with the setting so we can understand exactly what is going on. There's some nuances that are in today's text that we certainly need to understand deeply uh, before we get into the scripture. And so just to set the, the, the context, uh, we know at this point we're at the start of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, that's more of a formal name. Uh, we call it the book of Acts, but the Acts of the Apostles. This is when the apostles were going to go out and become witnesses and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what has happened at this point as we start chapter 1 in Acts, we know that Jesus Christ has been crucified. We know he's been buried. We know he has risen from the dead. And he has spent 40 days uh, among people uh, out and about after the resurrection. He was seen after the resurrection. And we know this because we can pull different texts from different books. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all tell of it, and Acts certainly tell of, uh, of Jesus spending time. But also, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you would see that Jesus was seen by over 550 people after his resurrection. So it is confirmed, it is fact, he has been risen from the dead. And so now in, in Acts chapter 1, we know all of this has happened, and now we get to this moment prior to Jesus' ascension into heaven, where he still sits, by the way, awaiting his second coming. Uh, but at this moment, there's almost like this pause moment where Jesus leaves uh, his disciples, the apostles, uh, with some instructions. He gives them two specific instructions before his ascension. And these are critical critical for us to understand as he leaves this information. The first thing he says is to wait, to wait, uh, wait for the promise of the Father, to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit is poured out upon them. So we need to understand that clearly, that Jesus said to wait. That was the first instruction. The second instruction that he had was that uh, they shall be witnesses. But this was after the Holy Spirit would come upon them. They would be empowered, if you will, and they would go out and be witnesses into all of the land. Uh, you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Samaria and into the ends of the earth, in the, into the end of the earth. And right after this moment, Jesus then ascends. And the, the scriptures tell us, us that he was taken up and the clouds received him out of their sight. And, and so that's, 
the first 11 verses, if you will, of Acts chapter 1. Then you get to Acts chapter 1, verse 12, and we see kind of a change in scenes. There's a gathering, if you will, of, of the, the disciples, the 11 now, because Judas uh, has betrayed, he's gone. And so it's the 11 plus Mary and some other women and uh, Jesus' brothers that are gathered. And it tells us that they're all in one accord and they're uh, gathered to get, gather in prayer and supplication. And so then there's another shift in the scene as we get uh, on downward uh, that there's another gathering, but this is a larger gathering. The Bible tells us uh, very specifically that it's some 120 people. It says disciples, but now understand sometimes disciples and apostles are used interchangeably, but this certainly is the 11 plus others. And when they say disciples here, it's followers of Jesus Christ. Just like we are disciples, we are followers, we are learners of Jesus Christ. So they're gathered together, and in this moment, Peter starts to talk, and he talks about the betrayal of Judas, and he talks about his, he used his money that he got from the betrayal to buy a field, and now he has died, and I'm not going to go into his death, another sermon for another day, but he dies, and he falls onto this land that he's purchased, and it's now called the field of blood, the field of blood. That's the first thing that Peter talks about. And the second thing he talks about, he quotes Psalms. And what's interesting, it's two different psalm that he, psalms that he quotes. And, and uh, you really need to dig in to the words that are said there. I'm not planning to do this today, but it, it is fascinating if you do this because it's from Psalm. It was written about David and his enemies, but it points forward to the Messiah uh, you, you certainly can see the Messiah in David's life and what he did, but there's a couple of things that uh, are, are mentioned, and it's specifically about his betrayal, in that another should take his office. Another should take his office. And so there's an implication from Peter here in this moment that Judas should be replaced. Judas should be replaced in this moment with another disciple. And so that... That is verses 1 through 20. That is the setup. That is the scene of the, the context of where we're at. So let's, let me read us through verses 21 through 26. That's today's text. Chapter 1, verses 21 through 26. And it says, therefore, which I've mentioned this before, therefore always is kind of a look back. And so the look back is everything I just told you. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they, and that's the group of 120, proposed two. Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, O Lord, you, O Lord, who, who know the hearts of all, show which of these who you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles." And so we, we get this visual of this event. And I'm, I'm going to put it in today's terms for us just real quickly what we have going on here. Now, obviously, we said the beginning of the church age was in chapter 2 when we had the day of, the Pentecost, uh, day of Pentecost and the preaching. And, and so this is preceding that. So you don't really have the church yet. But it, if you wanted to call it the church, you probably could. It's followers of Jesus Christ. And so there's a gathering of followers of Jesus Christ and they are engaged in what I would call a business meeting. A business meeting. They're talking about some things that have happened and something that they need to do. And so they, Peter walks them through what happens with Judas and the land uh, and the, the money and the fact that there is a vacant apostleship, a vacant apostleship, and that they need to vote and, and come up with a, another person. There's two people that are qualified per the qualifications that Peter lays out for them, and they cast lots and Matthias is chosen. 
Uh, and we're, we're, so we're told here that Matthias is chosen to replace Judas. Um, and that choice was made through this casting of lots, if you will. But it's interesting, uh, and when they cast lots, it, the thought there, it's a very Old Testament thing, that the Lord is controlling the casting of lots. And so that, that's how they are saying that the Lord has picked Matthias in this moment. But as I look at this, the questions start to pop in my mind that need to be asked. And, and my prayer is that you ask similar questions. See, as we study God's Word, uh, we're to read it, we're to consume it, uh, we're to understand it to the degree that we can, but we're also supposed to ask questions and study it, to grind it, as C.S. Lewis would say, to grind it to really understand the depth of what's happening. And so, as I start looking at this, you're going to hear a lot of questions that I, that I throw out as I study this text today. The first question is, why do they feel it's necessary to replace Judas? Why? Why did they replace him? Later, one of the apostles, James, was killed. He was beheaded in chapter 12 of Acts, yet they didn't replace him at that time. So why do they feel it's necessary to do that? Perhaps, you know, we're right on the verge of starting the church or something special is about to happen, so perhaps they, they believe we need to have 12 because Jesus originally had 12, and there's different notes about the 12 aligning with the 12 tribes of Israel. But was this the right thing to do? Was it the right thing to do in this moment? And when I ask this, please, I'm going to ask you not to get upset with me as I ask these questions. You see, the Bible tells us that we are to look at things in the Old Testament and the New Testament to understand errors that were made at different times and good uh, actions that were made all throughout. We're supposed to study the Bible and understand uh, and learn from it. And so as we ask these questions, it's healthy for us to ask these questions and understand the answers if we, as long as we dig into it. But So the question is, was this the right thing to do at this time? And so that's the path we're going to head down as we look at this. And the first thing we're going to do is look at verses 21 and 22 and so we can understand Peter's qualifications, the qualifications spoken by Peter. I'm not saying they're Peter's. He spoke these qualifications of who should be the apostles. He said he had to be one who had witnessed the entire ministry of Jesus from the time of his baptism uh, by John to the ascension. Above all, he had to have witnessed the, the resurrection. And, and from this, we understand kind of the basic roles of the apostles going into Acts. They were going to be witnesses. Remember, Je uh, Jesus said they were going to be witnesses at a later time when they were empowered, when they had the power of the Holy Spirit, they would be witnesses. They were to be eyewitnesses of Jesus' life, uh, eyewitnesses of his teaching, primary recipients of his teaching, and also eyewitnesses of his death, burial, and resurrection. And so they had specific duties that they were going to follow and perform in their life. And it's certainly a unique role that the apostles have. We could spend quite a while talking about the apostles, but I want to give you a couple of scriptures to make note of that tell us about the apostles. See, Ephesians 2 verse 20 tells us that our faith is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of our faith. And so we know it's a very specific and important role that these 12 have in this, in this time, in our faith, even in our faith today. Likewise, in Revelation, we see that in heaven, in the new Jerusalem, that the walls uh, of the city are built upon the 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles. And so we see that this number 12 is specific. The number 12 is unique. The number 12 is important for us to understand. And we understand later as we read also that the 12 apostles were going to be judges for the 12 tribes. And so we know and it sounds like that there should be 12, but Jesus didn't say anything about naming another person at this time. And so is it the right thing to do? We have to ask that question. You see, it begs a bigger question. Who appointed the 12? Jesus. 
But now we see these men and women that are gathered deciding that they need to appoint an apostle. So we come to this crossroads of faith, this crossroads of walking the walk, the crossroads, if you will. The original 12 were appointed by Jesus, not by man. But now man has determined what the qualifications are, and they're about to come up with the finalist. And so picture yourself in this meeting, and we know that Judas has abandoned the faith, and it's, we got to do something, right? We've got to do something. And so we take action. And I say we like we're sitting in the room, because as we read this, we are. And so let's see what happens. Verse 23, the people select two candidates. They put forward two candidates who meet the qualifications. And the candidates are Joseph and Matthias. Joseph and Matthias. Now, Joseph is described as being a man called Barsabbas. That is his formal name, if you will. Uh, and this, this name means son of the Sabbath, Barsabbas. He also has a nickname. It was very common for the Jews and the proselytes to have uh, Gentile nicknames. And so he has this nickname called Justice. And so there's three different names for this man, Joseph, Barsabbas, and Justice, that he goes by. And, and after that, we don't hear anything else about Barsabbas. Unless you go outside of the Bible, right? In the Bible, you don't hear anything about this man. But if you look at some historical records about those times and different religious writings that were around that time, not biblical, but others that supported, it, you would see writing by a man named Eusebius that said that Joseph, who was known as Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, went out into the missionary world, and at some point he was forced to consume poison, and it didn't affect him at all. That's the only other thing we hear about this man. And so now we move on to the second candidate. The second candidate is Matthias. Matthias, which name, his name means gift of God. And so all of a sudden you kind of start feeling, well, maybe, maybe this is the guy, but guess what? We don't hear another word about Matthias after this point at all. It's completely silent about Matthias, except for in the next a couple of verses. After chapter 1, we never hear about Matthias anymore. But in this moment, notice that the people have put forth their candidates, but something was critical, critically missing from their actions. And I just wonder, have you noticed what that is yet? I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Let's move on to the next verse. Verses 24 and 25, we see a prayer. We see a prayer. And in this prayer it says, O Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go in his own, to his own place. As I look at this prayer, I'm a bit perplexed, I have to tell you. Because this prayer, certainly the Lord knows the hearts of everyone. That's truth, that's fact. Certainly Judas did fall by his own transgression and is where he belongs certainly to this day. But notice this, notice this, that there was never a prayer prior to putting forth these candidates. And now that they have chosen the two candidates, they put forth their choice to God. They chose for themselves the finalists for this position. They determined their own criteria. They determined the candidates, and then they gave God the choice of what they thought was best. I don't know about you, but that seems a bit flawed to me. As I look at this process, there's a flaw because what was the last thing Jesus said? Wait. Wait for the Holy Spirit. You see, at this point, the Holy Spirit's not indwelling in them. At this point, they need to pray and seek the Spirit, seek the Holy Spirit, seek God's direction. At this point, they were supposed to wait but they didn't wait. They never prayed ahead of their own uh, down selection of candidates, if you will. And so it's interesting, if you look at this, how did they determine that this was the right time or the right place or the right uh, thing to do or even the right men other than by their own knowledge and their own power did they come up with these two finalists? And then they 
go to the Lord and they say, all right, we've chosen the best two candidates. You tell us which one's the one. Does that seem flawed? Does that seem flawed to you? Because it seems out of order for me. Rather than seeking God first, they came to God with their own selection and said, help me figure out this, this thing that we're doing. Now, I will say at least they prayed at this point. At least they prayed at that point. But let's go on to the next verse, verse 26. And this is the verse that I call the people's choice. The people's choice. The prayer concluded and they cast lots, which by the way, if you're not familiar with this, this is an Old Testament method that they used to see God's, God's will and God's decision on certain things. They would take a jar and they would put stones or markers inside that and they would have somehow either written on or uh, have noted that this stone or this marker belongs to uh, Matthias and this one belongs to Justice and they would put it into the jar and I'm assuming that they would shake the jar. I don't know if they shook it or not but then they would pour that jar out, and the first one that came out, that would be the selection by God's power. God, the, the, the marker that God selected would be the first one that came out, and so they did that, and the selection was Matthias. Matthias. But again, I go back to, isn't it interesting that you never hear of Matthias again? It's completely silent. He's selected by his constituents but we never hear of him doing God's work or God's ministry. Now, I will tell you, for those that study with us on Wednesday nights, uh, we just we were studying different verses. Last Wednesday night, we talked about, uh, or two Wednesday nights ago, we talked about Romans 8, 28, right? I kind of want to get everybody that was there to, to quote that with us, but it says, and we know that all, all things work for good for those who love God and those who are called according to His purposes. So without a doubt, these people love God. Without a doubt, they're seeking His will. And so without a doubt, God made this good. He, he created good from this moment. But it begs the question, was it the right thing to do? Did they follow His instructions to what He said? And you might ask, well, well how do we know? How do we know if this was the right one or not? How do we know if there's a different person? The answer is in the Bible, right? In the Bible, Acts chapter 9. If you read ahead, and I'm not going to ask you to do that right now, you see the calling of Saul who became Paul. That was the next selection by Jesus. You see, all the other 11 were chosen, hand-chosen, specifically chosen by Jesus to be apostles. Matthias is the one that was not. But it says in the Bible that he was counted with the 11. Now here's the question. As you look at scriptures and you, you move forward to Revelation to where we see the new Jerusalem and we know the city walls have the names of the 12 the, the apostles on it. Whose names are on there? And I bet you we could guess 11 100% accurately. But who is number 12? Who is number 12? I wish I could take a poll real quick, but I'm not going to do that. You see, the answer is we don't know. We don't know. The Bible is completely silent on who the 12th person is. I personally believe it's, it's Paul. But I could also argue with that to say, well, it says that Matthias was counted with the eleven. But Paul was an active disciple. In fact, in Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, he tells us that he was chosen. He was chosen. He said that he said in his introduction, Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, it says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor from man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. He identified himself as the apostle, as an apostle. And so I personally believe that he is listed as the 12th apostle on the walls in heaven in the New Jerusalem. But that's my opinion. Truthfully, when we look at something like that, we have to settle for the words, and settle is the wrong choice of words, but align with the words from uh, the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel when they say, O oh Lord, thou knowest. God is the only one who knows at this point who's on that 12th uh, wall. And, of course, most of us in our human voices would say, I can't wait to find out. And I would say, you're absolutely wrong. When you get to heaven, you're going to worship Jesus, and that's all that's going to matter. Everything else won't matter at that point. You're just going to worship Jesus. And so we may be asking, okay, why are we doing this? 
Why are we studying this? Why, why does this matter? And how does it apply to my life here in 2023? This is the point I always get to on any given Sunday. And actually, any time I study the Bible. This is, this is I, I've got to say this, and, and I know it's going to take a few extra minutes, but this is the way I study the Bible. And, and it's one that was taught to me a while back, and it absolutely makes sense. When you study the Bible, <coughs> excuse me, you have to take a journey back. They call it a bridge. You take this bridge back to the ancient days and you study the Bible in their terms, in their cultures, in their times and understand it from their perspective. And then you cross back over that bridge to today's world and you say, how do I apply it today to me right now? You have to convert it over and understand it but not lose any of the importance of the time. And so we have to ask that question every time we study God's Word. And so I want to give you two applications just real quickly this morning. I do want you to remember uh, Romans 8, 28, that uh, we know all, all things work for the good, right? So we know God used this in the right way. We know that without a doubt. But there's two applications that I would give you. One is for us as a church body, and the other is for each of us individually. And so as uh, the first one being for the church body, I already mentioned that we're going to be selecting deacons. We're going to start that process next week. And so... Uh, there's a sheet, uh, and I don't know, it, I, I mentioned it earlier, there's a sheet of all the candidates uh, that you should have gotten on the way in this morning. The candidates uh, by our Constitution is all the men who are over 21 who meet the, the right criteria. There's a whole list of criteria. And so on that sheet, there's the, the men that are eligible to be elected deacons in our next meeting. You see, every year uh, we elect new deacons. We have uh, a three-year term, and so you serve for three years. On the third year, you roll off. Three men do. So we're going to have three vacancies coming up. And so next week, next Sunday, on July 30th, we're going to vote for three men. And you'll circle three men's name on this, and from that list, the deacons will compile, and they'll come up with a list of six that are eligible. They're the finalists, the final finalists. They're the down selection. They are Joseph and Matthias, right, if we look at today's uh, text. And then on the following week, we would do our final vote uh, as we look at that, and we would select the finalists. Now, remember the one thing that was missing from today's text. Prayer. Prayer. The application of today is that we need to learn from today's text to understand that we need to be in prayer now ahead of the vote, ahead of all the things that are going to happen uh, next week. This should not be a popularity vote. This should not be a popularity vote at all. This needs to be who God is leading you to vote for to be used. You see, it doesn't have to be the oldest person. It doesn't have to be the youngest person. It doesn't have to be the person with the most education. It doesn't have to be the person that works the hardest. It needs to be who God calls to be a deacon at this church. Once we come up with that list, we'll vote on the finalists. But my point to Salute a Baptist Church is that we need to be in prayer. And I would beg, I would implore you to take that list that you have and look at the list every day and pray over that list every day, earnestly and honestly seeking what the Lord would have you to do in your prayer, in your vote next week. Truly pray over who God wants to be the next deacons here at this church. Second thing is for us as individuals. This is a broad question, if you will. A simple question is that, and that is, how do we approach God with our daily decisions? Or maybe more importantly, uh, it, do you seek God in your daily decisions that you make? And you, you look at that and you go, well, certainly on the important ones, I call out to God and I seek his direction and I, I ask for him to lead me. But shouldn't it be even for the small things in your life? I mean, do we need to pray over what we wear? All the time, yes. I just spent a week at the beach, and I would tell you this, even though you can wear something, you shouldn't wear certain things in your life. I saw things that I haven't seen in a long time out on the beach this week, and I was truly embarrassed, and, and just, I, I still can't, uh, I have nightmares right now uh, about things that I saw. But you know what? That's not just at the beach. That's here in town. I look at some of the things 
that young people and old people, I'm not going to call out any age group, you know, we ought to pray over what we wear. By the way, we ought to pray over what we eat. We ought to pray over what we drink. We ought to pray over what we consume in our bodies. Because there was so much of something in the air down in Destin, by the way, I couldn't get any fresh air anywhere. My son and my daughter, they knew exactly what it is. They said that, well, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but they said uh, it, that it's just the way it is, Dad. I said, no, it's not. My body is the temple of God is what my Bible tells me. And so why would I put anything in my body that's going to distort my body or make me have hallucinations or altered states of mind? I don't understand it at all. I know, I know these things happen in the world. They don't happen at 472 Greenwood Highway, and they never will as far as I'm concerned. Do they? I'm just kidding. I just... <laughs> Sorry. For a moment, I thought I was the boss there, but I, I know better. You see, the Bible tells us, many of us know Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your, lean not on your own understanding. We quote that, and, and we, we seemingly live by that, but we live, leave out, conveniently live, leave out, the very next verse, which says, in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will guide your paths. That's what my Bible says. In all my ways, to seek the Lord. And so our application of this as individuals is that everything in our lives we need to pray over. Every decision that you face you need to pray over. And you need to hear the words that Jesus spoke to the apostles. Wait. Wait until you hear from God. Wait until the Holy Spirit speaks to you. You see, we, we look at the Old Testament and we look at the New Testament and we say, how could they have been so impatient? How could they have been so resistant? How could they? But you know what? If we look at our own selves, if we look in the mirror, the true mirror that is reflective of our lives, our true lives, we would see that we too are an impatient, stiff-necked people these days. If we don't get our answers in our time, then we move on and we become just like Peter in today's text and we start coming up with our own solutions. And then we ask God to correct it along the way if it starts going astray. We need to seek God. We need to seek God. And so as I come to a close this morning, I would ask you, heads bowed, eyes closed, perhaps today's the day that you change any and all mindset that you have, that you truly seek the Lord first in all that you do. Seek Him and wait in all that you do. Seek the Lord, for He is wise. Seek the Lord because He is good. Seek the Lord because He is holy. Seek the Lord because He is our Creator, our Master, our Savior, our King. We belong to Him. Every fiber of our body belongs to Him. And we should honor Him with all of our decisions and all of our ways. Seek the Lord and wait for His instruction and live your life in accordance with His will. Dear Heavenly Father, I just come to you this morning and I lift up this church body, our family, my family, oh Lord. I love each and every person here so dearly. And you know that's true. You know my heart. But Father, there's times that we grow impatient. There's times that we think we know what is best. And Father, we ask your forgiveness right here and right now. Father, forgive us for being an impatient, stiff-necked people. Forgive us for trying to take actions in our own hands. Forgive us for not seeking your will. Forgive us, Father, for not waiting. Your timing is perfect, and we know that. Father, help us to be patient. Help us to seek you in all that we do. Father, I pray over each person here today. Dear Lord, I pray for those that may not know Jesus as their Savior. I pray today would be the day that they would come to know you, that you would convict their hearts before it's everlasting too late.
Father, that they would come to know you this very morning. And dear Lord, that they would live on and have everlasting life because of your son, what he did on the cross, when he poured out his blood on our behalf to give us forgiveness of sins. And Father, arising out of the grave to give us eternal life. He defeated death. Father, he is our king. He is our savior. And Father, I pray that you would convict hearts that may not know your son Jesus. Father, I pray for those that need healing. Father, I know there's many who need spiritual healing and physical healing. Father, I pray for those that need spiritual uh, healing that you would uh, be real to them at this very moment. Father, that they would come and confess the ways that they've been living in the world versus living for you. And Father, for those that have physical needs, I pray over them right now. Dear Lord, that you would provide the healing touch that is needed in their lives, whatever that might be. Father, I pray for those that may be visiting with us today, looking for a new church home. If it's your will, oh Lord, if it's your will, we pray that they would fellowship with us at Saluda Baptist Church. Father, I just pray over each and every person. You know the need. You know the joy in our lives. And you know the pains that we have as well. And Father, I just pray that we would feel your touch at this moment. And dear Lord, that we would celebrate you and focus upon you and live our lives for you. Father, I, I just give you all the praise this morning. I thank you for this text. I thank you for the lessons. And Father, I thank you for all that you've done and you're going to do in our lives. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a time of invitation. If you'd please stand. Thank you all so much for being here today. Please remember those forms. If you don't have one, please get one on your way out. Deacons, I would ask you to be ready with those, to hand those out as needed, uh, and be in prayer over that list for next week. We need to seek God uh, in all that we do, especially on critical things like that, but in everything in our lives, we need to seek God. We'd uh, also invite you to be back Wednesday night. We have our Bible study, 6 o'clock here on Wednesday nights. I don't think Brandon's not over there. Club SBC, is it starting it's not started yet, right? So we still have our Wednesday night programs for youth and children. Uh, we, just, we have everything that you would ever want as far as Bible studies on Wednesday nights, all starting around 6 o'clock. Please come and join us and get that midweek uh, refreshment, is what I would call it, re-nourishment in God's Word. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for the day. I thank you so much for the blessings that you've given us. Father, I thank you so much for your precious Word. Father, I thank you for this time that we've had to gather as a church body. And Father, united, uh, focused upon you, seeking you in all that we do. And Father, I pray, dear Lord, that you would grant us each opportunities this week to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, give us opportunities where we may witness to others as we're called to do. Father, we love you so much, and we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.